This month's episode is brought to you by the cash type CITO, or CITO if you insist on saying it that way. A cash in, trash out. Look for these events as a way to help clean up and give back to nature, which is so patient in letting us hide our little containers and doohickeys in it for us to keep finding. They can be good exercise too, even if you use a grabber tool. Find one near you, meet other geocachers, clean up the neighborhood, have fun. This is TGIF Geocaching Radio, a monthly audio show all about geocaching and the excellent adventures that await us. And I'm Jeff, a.k.a. The Bruce Zero, so stay tuned and let's hang out. Yeah, in my area, there are a handful of people who are hosting CEDO events, and even throughout these winter months. Earlier this month, we had one, and it was cold, frozen, and the ground was hard. But in a way, it made picking up that litter a little easier. It helped that it was at a gold mine of a location, too, with so much trash tossed down a hill beside a parking lot. We filled up a trailer to overflowing with trash bags, including a rolled-up carpet, a mannequin head, to a broken ceramic toilet and loads of other tossed oddities. It was insanity. And if it were summer, it would have probably been much rougher and smellier. All right, on a more pleasant note, let's knock off a few quick news items. Did you set sail in 2023? If you logged a geocache, attended an event, or worked on an adventure sometime in the first week of January, you'll have earned the set sail souvenir for your profile. Be sure to watch for those little souvenir promos and what you need to do to complete the goals. I find they do help vary your geocaching experience and give you a little extra nudge in how you plan your geocaching adventures. Whether it's making time to find caches on specific days or focus on finding certain types of caches. But I personally love when they have a good theme or even a sort of storyline like Signal's Labyrinth. It's some nice little flavoring to add to the hobby, whether completing them is a challenging task or a piece of cake. You can find the active souvenir promotions quickly in the official geocaching app or on geocaching.com. It has been a while since we've had a Lone Wolf contest update. A couple of episodes ago, I announced a contest to win a special secret prize, an exclusive one you won't want to miss for an upcoming project. To win, all you have to do is follow the instructions and be one of the first 50 to complete the task. Instructions can be found in the episode show notes and description. Watch the 12 videos in the Lone Wolf Legacy Cash Tour series at Cash the Line on YouTube and find 11 words marked by a yellow smiley somewhere within them. Then, in video playlist order, string all 11 words together without spaces and visit www.cashtheline.net slash and then that string of words, then follow the steps there. And so far we've got 16 winners, so there's still many more spots to fill. Stay tuned because a full announcement about this project will be coming very soon later this year. And I am excited! (laughs) And speaking of prizes, Geocaching HQ has launched a new little distraction, a web-based geocaching game. It's still in its beta testing, but anyone who participates has a chance to win a t-shirt. For three weeks between January 24th and February 14th, Each week, five people will be drawn to win a t-shirt, and at the end, another five will be drawn from all entrants. So visit geocaching.com slash geogames, G-E-O-G-A-M-E-S, and follow the instructions. In this game, you're looking for clues to a location on the map by viewing geocache pins around the world, and if you can solve and pinpoint the hidden location, which is an invisible pin, you can enter your name into the draw for the current week and the bonus draw at the end. So get over there and play. The game resets every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Ringing in the new year, Geocaching HQ also announced statistics for the 2022 year in review. It was a busy year with almost 2 million active geocachers around the world, and with an average of 43 fines per geocacher for the whole year, Well, I don't want to do the math. (laughs) I know quite a few people who managed two or three thousand finds in 2022 alone, including myself, which was an effort to qualify for a challenge that required three consecutive years of over 2,000 finds each. 
So glad that's done. <laughs> but if word is accurate, there are way many more geocachers who find fewer than, say, 10 geocaches in a whole year. Usually people trying out the app for the first time. So suffice to say, there are definitely hotspots of geocaching activity around the world, and their statistics show that the most finds were logged in Germany, USA, the Netherlands, France, and Great Britain. But I'm just happy to see a familiar country in the most hides statistic, which includes the USA, Germany, France, Canada, and Great Britain. <laughs> if you live in a country that wasn't mentioned here, then I hope your community is growing and your geocaching increases this year. And maybe you can be on the list next year. Now, all that to say, it can be a whole lot of fun working on numbers, and people are excited to share their milestones and accomplishments, like fizzy grids and jasmer grids, finds in a year, finds each date of the year, and much more. And if it's not obvious, I love challenges. <laughs> Taking geocaching to a whole new level, it's like gaming the game. But that said, I'd also love to see this numbers and statistics trend take a bit of a turn back towards that core experience of geocaching. Going on adventures, discoveries, learning, traveling, the fun of the find, the containers. Maybe more of that will reduce the concerns some people have around numbers caching, where people seem to desire statistical accomplishments over the joy of what the geocache journey or the find in the hand can provide. I know that Ontario is a challenge caching hotspot, and we have so many massive series of power trails of a variety of experiences, from park and grab roadsides to hiking trails to paddle caching on rivers and lakes. But one thing I feel like we lack in my region of southern Ontario are hotspots of gadget caches, creative geocaches, especially in safer areas that aren't as prone to muggles and vandalism. I kind of miss that. But I certainly don't miss the amazing nature and adventures that await in our beautiful provincial and national parks. And this is all leading into a topic that's been trending a bit in discussions on social media recently about the way people play this geocaching hobby or the different ways people enjoy the activity. I recently joined the Geocaching Podcast on their episode 750, Playing Your Own Way, to chat about this hot button topic after I'd made a comment about how I don't really like that phrase quote, everyone plays their own way. <laughs> I prefer to think of it more like everyone enjoys the hobby for different reasons, because there are guidelines within which we can properly and safely enjoy the activity, and we can all enjoy different aspects of that activity. But we also can't forget that it's a community-driven hobby. So in an effort to encourage a positive and healthy community, I also like to incorporate the golden rule, you know, treat others the way you'd like to be treated. I think it's a good practice to try not to be bothered or offended when somebody else plays in a way that affects you and to try not to play in a way that intentionally bothers or offends someone else. It's not a competition. <laughs> it really drags the community down. It is, of course, though, a tough line to draw. We have an excellent interview this episode with a guest who's certainly decided where that line is. <laughs> we will be chatting about one of the most popular challenges geocachers like to complete, the geocaching term Jasmer. It's a word named after the first creator of the challenge, Jasmer B, to denote the statistical accomplishment of finding at least one geocache that was placed in every month since geocaching began in May of 2000. Completing one full Jasmer grid, that's every month in every year, including the current month, <laughs> it's no small feat and requires a decent amount of traveling to accomplish. I finished my own first Jasmer grid in 2017 after eight years of geocaching, finding a geocache that was about to be archived. You can watch that video at cachetheline.net slash sleepyhollow. It gets harder as time rolls on because geocaches that qualify for those oldest months slowly get archived, making it harder and harder to complete those old months. As of today, the highest number of complete Jasmer grids a geocacher can fill is four, because there are only four geocaches in the world still active that were placed in August of 2000. There's three in North America and one in Sweden. 
If you were geocaching before the fifth or sixth act of geocache in that month was archived, it's possible you could earn five or six Jasmer grids. But imagine being the only one today to fill six complete Jasmer grids. How is that even possible? Well, let's dive in and chat with TTO2 and find out just how he managed to snag six complete Jasmer grids and hear firsthand about this most excellent geocaching adventure. All right, so we have here with us TTO2, that's Vince Rowe, and uh, he is here to give us a little bit of an insight about how he accomplished getting six complete Jasmer grids. So first off, welcome, Vince. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's great seeing you or talking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. So first question, have you completed, do you have a complete Jasmer grid as of today? Have you found a cache that was placed this month? I did, yes. Yay, okay, that's good. So you do have six Jasmer grids currently. Uh, no, that's not true. So oh. I'm going to qualify the question. Do I have six Jasmine grids this month? No, I don't. Uh -huh. Do I have a full Jasmine grid? Yes, I have one. <laughs> so as of December of last month, yes, I have six. But I, I still need five additional this month to to get to my six, six loop. So if you were looking at a, a checker, a checker said you wouldn't qualify for the six Jasmers. Right. And we'll, we'll probably get into more detail about that. Yeah, in a bit. So secondly, just a little bit to get to know you. Uh, what was it that got you into geocaching? How long have you been caching? Um, I was a, a league ranked player in racquetball uh, back when I was 50 years old, many years ago, back in 2012. I uh, ended up having to fight traffic to get to a racquetball court in, in evenings. And I'd sit around the racquetball court with nothing to do for two hours. And one of my league players said, hey, why don't you uh, uh, spend your time and go around here and look for these geocache things? I said, well, what's that? Introduced me, oh, they put Tupperware underneath bridges and stuff, and you go find it. And I said, okay, let me take a look at that. And ever since that day, needing to kill two hours, is that uh, I, I jumped into kind of the, the craze. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was leaving in 2014, said, all right, that was good. I did my time and, and left and and then a Canadian stimulated me to get back in and torment the obsessed. That's what TTO, TTO stands for. <laughs> and that game is my game. I absolutely love that game. That, oh, that is far better than the, the originally intended game. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. There, so, there's been a lot of discussion recently with uh, a number of uh, podcasts and, and, uh, and, and forums and whatnot about... Uh, uh, geocaching etiquette. So I'm sure that would be a topic that you would absolutely have a lot to say about. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I love talking about imaginary rules that people have made up. <laughs> it, I, like I said, if they, if they're written down, then, Hey, I, I'm, I'm in, but um, you know, when you come to design a game is that you just, you know, a board game when you sit down and somebody rolls a dice and they, they say, you get this, they land on a square or whatever it happens to be. And they said, well, that means this. So mm -hmm. no, it doesn't. The rules don't say that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. That's how we play it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to deal with house <laughs> exactly rules. Heard and, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. well, this is how get we played in Iowa. Yeah, this is how <laughs> we played in Florida. <laughs> I, I know a couple of people that have played games like Boggle with and, and whatnot, where the house rules have always been the rules that they play by. And nobody's ever questioned it until somebody from outside comes in and says, Wait a second, that's not that's not a rule. <laughs> so who? How do you play? Do you play by theirs or yours? It's not a written rule. So how do you walk into how do you walk into a game and say, well, wait a minute, I'm I'm my strategy is this, and I'm this is the game mm. I'm playing, and you just have rules that I I don't know about, <laughs> and you can't travel the world. Yeah. Uh, so what is it that you do for a living? What's your career? Because I see a lot of traveling on your side. Yeah, I, I'm a retired guy. Mm -hmm. I uh, uh, had owned uh, several hedge funds. I was the operating manager of several hedge funds, and uh, we actually did extremely well during the down market. We were short many, many positions, and uh, it allowed me when I was uh, 50 to, to check out and travel and, and pay for uh, seven kids. I have seven kids and all their college educations and I was hoping for a couple of dumb ones. I didn't. They all want to go out of state too. So that's expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, 
it was smart enough to put 529 plans here. That's the thing in the States to save for college. And um, so they're fine. The kids are good. And, and, and then I needed something to do. My wife didn't want to retire. She, she doesn't. That's why we're in Tulsa. She's just got a big C, CMO job here, chief medical officer job here in Tulsa. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I kind of tag along with her. And, and um, in my hobby, the things that I do is that she allows me to do is, is uh, travel and, and geocache. Mm-hmm. So How many so, countries have you visited so far? We're in 35 now. It's not very high compared to some some folks. But 35 <laughs> countries is yeah. is uh, is uh, good. You know, like I said, is that um, I'm, I'm getting older and uh, mm-hmm. things are slowing down, so I don't do as much. But it's uh, one of those things that uh, I, I, I do enjoy uh, with my caching partner TTO One Kathy, mm-hmm. and is that uh, uh, she's got a goal of all the 2000s. So we're, we're clicking those off every year. Two or three at a time until we get to all 116 that they're still active. Do you know how many caches are still active that were placed in 2000? One, 116. 116. 116. So one's in Nairo- Nairobi. So let's hopefully in, uh, we get there. Nine in New Zealand. <laughs> we still have like four four in Australia. Mm. But um, they're, they're all on the list. They're all on, uh, on program to to um, uh, hopefully finish up by 2025. So this is like... One of your biggest goals right now is to get every 2,000 cash. That's correct. And uh, so of all of these adventures that you've done, is there one that mm-hmm. uh, really sticks out as like a favorite? Um, we really, really had uh, an amazing time in Australia. Australia had a couple of our most favorite caches in the world um, down by the beach where, where the ocean had kind of carved out a trail along the, the, the uh, along the, uh, shoreline and you walked inside the inside the the uh side of the cliff uh, on a trail that they made and or the the ocean had made which is pretty cool mm-hmm. and then you know our favorite place to cache is utah is that you know zion and, and angels landing oh, and yeah. the narrows and canyon lands and the four-wheel driving there it's just you know some, some of the places in utah are just incredible mm-hmm. uh that, that we've been and try and go every year at least one trip there yeah. And uh, it's beautiful, I mean, just beautiful. I will say I have looked up Angel's Landing and that oh, it's just, it, it's my palms sweat just thinking about it. I so <laughs> want to go there. <laughs> the last half mile that makes that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's the last half mile. Yeah. And that's uh, it, it's just a beautiful view once you get up there. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the Zion Valley is just incredible. But don't play downplay Moab or you know oh, yeah. the arches and in in Bryce yeah. uh, Canyonlands and you know we went on a hundred mil drive on a four wheel drive road that uh, was just beautiful to a place called White Crack. Um, I'm I'm up against seven cash type uh, um, fizzy grits and we're down to one. Mm-hmm. And as you know, next year is our our final one, mm-hmm. which is uh, up north. Yeah. And uh, that that's taken quite a few years. And one of those one of those virtuals was out in White Crack, like into the highway. It was just uh, way out there in, in Canyonlands on a on a road called the uh, I believe the White White Rim White 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 Rim Road around Canyonlands. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's just beautiful out there too. So that's one of our favorite places. Desert. We like desert too. <laughs> well, you've got uh, you've got a couple of jeeps, I think, right? We do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so anybody who loves outdoor adventuring and traveling has got to have a couple of jeeps, especially in the desert. Yeah, and and like I said, is that I, I wish we did more, but uh, for the most part, is that uh, taking a, a jeep out to some of the exciting places is is nice, but so it ends up being you know you get to end of the trail in the jeep, and then. There's a mountain in front of you, right? And there's a, <laughs> and there's a hiking trail, or there's something that you got to go. You know, White Crack was uh, another distance out after mm-hmm. you after you got to the end of the road. But still, it was a b- beautiful hike along um, the, the north rim of of, uh, of Grand Canyon too. Was another place we went. So that mm-hmm. was into the road, but you got to hike down to the the cache on the, by, next to the river. Yeah. So we we talk a lot about uh, these excellent excellent adventures that you go on, but do you do any casual caching? Do you, get, do you find lamppost caches? Do you find caches, micros um, in pine trees? <laughs> um, our good friend Dave turned me on to uh, a, a new grid, uh, which is uh, placed month by type. I don't know if you saw that. Mm-hmm. So as of probably the last six months, I've been going 
I, and I guess it's not casual if, if I'm going out of my way to go find a place month type, uh, it, you know, and there's not a challenge because it, it's not one that you can, you, you can actually use, uh, uh, I think or is not within the new rules, but um, it is placed you. month by type yeah. is, is taking me to some casual lamppost casters that were multis in 2004 of January, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So I've, I've done a little bit of that, but um, to go out of my way to do something along the line, say, Hey, I wonder if there's something over there. No, I'd rather, I'd rather put something out. I'm, I've, mm -hmm. I've got some new ideas, you know, some, some new things that, that uh, I'm going to do with the our little LBBs, which are which are uh, little brown buggers, we call them. But <laughs> um, and some new types. I, I, I enjoy placing caches as well. So, so yeah, I was about to ask, like you do a lot of cache finding. What's your current find tally right now, or your smiley count? Around forty one thousand. Nothing impressive. I uh, for yeah, most people, good. that's like the top two percentile, probably. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't. I don't know where that. Fits, but the, the the reason it's so well again, there's a couple of reasons, but the reason ours is so low is because uh, I'm I'm obsessed with the DT average, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm I'm now at three three average for forty one thousand cash. That's that's and big. That's what's it's hard enough to get a two two average. I, and, and and so so when when you when you go on trips and somebody asked me on on, on another uh, podcast in Germany and they said, so, so you drive by all these caches? I said, yes, I drive by probably a hundred thousand <laughs> caches in, in, in the time I've been geocaching mm -hmm. to get to the caches that I want. And, yeah. um, and they, they, they were like stymied that is that how can you drive by caches when you know there's one there? I said, for me, it's easy, right? Mm. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Right. You don't have to find them all. Yeah, what is the saying I have is that one I have and one I have are dead to me, right? Like <laughs> two twos, or, and yeah. you know, now that we've gone over three, is that you know most of the, our searches are all three and a half, three and a half or above, and mm -hmm. and uh, we'll we'll stay on that course as long as we can. Yeah. So, so really, you're you're kind of in the, in the same boat, a similar boat as I am, where um, I don't want to say like obsessed about statistics, but statistics and accomplishments kind of drive your geocaching strategies, looking for um, holes and stats. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, people said, Oh, well, you're, you're, you're doing this for that or this is said, no, I do it for myself. I do it uh, uh, based on milestones that I set based on what I believe are other cashers stats, mm -hmm. meaning as a Papa Tony, I believe he's legit you know, over in, uh, in Germany. He's the, the, the one your DT looper over there and, mm -hmm. and met Papa Tony several times had dinner with him and his family and, and 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 he he is legit. I mean, he, what he does is is he likes to go after the the lo lower right, and the lower right gives me for me a much better experience than the upper left mm -hmm. and the, the, the quadrant of the DT grid. And mm -hmm. so you, you you you'll find some things in like the, the one lines, meaning is that you'll find a good one five, or you will find a, a good one one terrain somewhere that's a high difficulty that that made you think and, and mm -hmm. get through the through the the puzzle or whatever whatever cash it was but you know for for me it's mostly the the lower right yeah so for anybody who uh is listening and isn't quite sure because there's a whole lot of lingo being tossed around um yeah i'm sorry i apologize oh no that's absolutely fine because uh for the most part i think uh listeners of this podcast or followers of cash the line are uh well aware of a lot of the statistical terms and 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 challenge style accomplishments that are out there but uh that just goes to show how much and how, how varied this hobby really can be. And we talk about how, uh, you know, everybody plays for their own reasons. They enjoy different aspects of the hobby. And, you know, we who love filling out statistics doesn't mean that this is some um, higher, more advanced thing. It's just a different way of enjoying the hobby. Because, sure, we might be skipping a whole lot of simple roadsides and things, but there could be also a whole lot of really wonderful geocaches that we end up skipping because we don't know because we're just focusing on something else. So it's like, it's just a different way of enjoying the hobby. So it was funny is uh, somebody asked me the other day is that, so I put up quite a few cash. We have the, you know, hopefully soon the world record uh, geo art out in West, uh, West Texas. Um, as far as caches, they say, so when you put them out, how do you rate them? And they said, we believe you, you do bogus ratings. And I said, well, I do ratings based on a person that I believe is the average cacher. Mm. 
there's the, the person that I believe is the average cashier. And I take that person's capabilities from puzzle solving to physical capability. And, and I rate cashiers based on what I believe that person can do, because I think that person represents the breadth of what I have seen globally mm -hmm. around the world of what uh, the demographic of geocachers are. Yeah. That's what I believe it is. Yeah. So I, I don't rate it based on, on uh, let me just make this up because I need it or, or somebody needs it. I said, let's let's do it based on what I believe that person can do. Yeah. And then those argument is the terrain all about cardio. So if it, it said, so <laughs> does your heart rate have to be at 165 or 45 for, for a sustained 90 minute period? <laughs> to, to, to be a three and a half i yeah. no, <laughs> i don't believe that person can climb a tree <laughs> yeah and we've we've had those issues around here as well like how do you rate a tree climb because I've, I've seen i've had to do right. tree climbs that are rated a two terrain that ended up being what i thought more like a four or four and a half and then there's some that are rated three and a half that are one step off the ground like it, it's it's not an easy thing for a cash owner to decide on a difficulty and terrain rating and really the only thing that you can do as an owner is decide on something that you believe to be accurate and maybe I right. give a little bit of a hint or something so that people understand what they're up against, but that's all you can do. Because you're always gonna have people saying, that's too low or that's too high. And I wanna, I wanna make the point that, you know, I, I am in the fortunate position that I do get to travel globally. And if you think these problems are unique to, to Canada, or you think they're unique to North America? They're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are these are problems that globally they deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, meaning that there's a, a place where a guy will do a two and a half, and it's 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 using pitons on the side of the Alps, mm -hmm. right, to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Normal for well, them is like a one and a half, one and a half. Well, you, you see that out in the the Rockies in the West as well. There's a lot of really low rated difficulty in oh. terrain. I'm like, this is out in the wilderness. This is on the side of mountains. Like over here, that would be like a two and a half, four. Like it's just, it's so different in the local region. And I'm overnighting. I'm overnighting with my camping gear to get to this, this, this three terrain cache that's mm -hmm. a two, three. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what the experience is. Is if there was an experience level, is a the, you know the, the beauty of what it was to be able to get to that cash. Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, yeah. but there's no rating for yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you just hope that the the, the COs are accurate and you do your research and if you do enough research you, mm -hmm. you'll be able to tell that two three is not going to be not going to be the two three you're going to find in in, right. in the middle of, of um, ancaster or yeah somewhere. it's one of those things if you're out only for statistics then you're not taking into consideration its local region and the kind of experiences that oh, you, you could have missed the game in my opinion yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you you've missed the entire premise of the game yeah you know, yeah even though they said hey put a cache where something's interesting. How many times have we been to uh, a, a, a homeless camp or, or, or some kind of dump, you know, mm -hmm. and so, whoa, what, what was interesting here? How many times does that happen? Right? Yeah. But, yeah. Well, one more question before we go to a break. Uh, sure. How many caches do you own? I think we're about um, 2,500 caches. 2,500. Okay. What you got to realize <laughs> is, that, is that we did the, the snake which is a geo art that was to take the place of the world record existing now in Spain of some mm -hmm. square box map looking thing, uh, geo right. art to be the largest uh, geo art in the world, mm -hmm. in the geocaching geo art in the world. And that's in West Texas. Mm -hmm. So everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah, you know, it's, that's true because is that one commodity that we have a lot of is, is land. <laughs> I mean, we have lots of land here, yeah. and there's space. And um, even though a lot of it's landlocked because these leases that farmers get and they put fences around it, you can't get to it, even though it's public lands. Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, most people don't know that, but um, it's uh, geocasters don't like to go beyond a fence. So yeah, I try and keep yeah. them on the, on the road easements and things like that. And just to clarify, there are series that are larger than that, geocache series. So this is really about specifically about a geo art, oh. which... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Deciding yeah, what yeah, qualifies is... as a geo art is itself <laughs> another argument. <laughs> yeah. The e ET Highway is probably it, its first rendition is bigger than the, yeah. the 1200. But, yeah. but the amount of work that goes into doing a geo art that large, mm -hmm. massive. Yeah. You can only imagine because you've got to have the coordinates have got to be uh, in a way that make it look like something. And then you've got to either do yeah. offsets or physical locations, all this stuff. Yeah. Like it's a whole lot of work to make 
a good geo art. Yeah. So the big thing was the two mile limit. So you have to put mm-hmm. the caches within the two mile limit to make something that's, you know, somewhat looks like geo art that yeah. would qualify for geo art. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things that go into it, and then reviewer processes and and landowner processes and conflicts and things that we've had to get over. We had a area on the snake that people that we had. I, I think it was a meth lab out there that that people didn't want to invade by their houses, so they were shooting shooting over the heads of any geocachers that came down the road. And it's crazy stories. <laughs> wow. But this is Texas; everybody owns a gun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is time for the patron adventurer of the month. Cash the Line is supported by a band of excellent adventurers through Patreon who graciously pitch in and help the channel continue to grow and improve. And for this show, our patron adventurer of the month is Raj King. Roger is a longtime supporter and a longtime friend. A rally driver and ham radio enthusiast, he's often been the designated driver for Team Fart, who've been seen in some of my geocaching videos for road trips and geocaching day trips. Thank you to Raj King for your ongoing support of Cash the Line and for being a great friend. You too can help support Cash the Line and unlock bonus content and swag, including participating in Project EGA, by visiting patreon.com slash cash the line. Patreon.com slash cash the line. Your support is appreciated. Hey, hey, what's up? Question for the group. Do you all recognize this sound? Oh, a mild headphone warning, just in case. That's find number 212 for me, and like the third cache I found since uh, Signal started in the new uh, labyrinth. (laughs) Hashtag no judge. Anyways, other than uh, some voicemail geocaching, just wanted to say uh, hi, Jeff. Love all the content. Keep it up, bud. Peace. That was the voice of Cody Cash out on scene phoning one in. Thanks for that little POI. You can call in and share something as well by visiting cashtheline.net slash POI. If you know me, you know I absolutely love a good tree climb geocache. But I've learned to be cautious around tree climbs. Something's always up with them. (laughs) Ah, sorry, I kill me. (laughs) This next discovery seems right out of an adventure movie. What would you do if you found, hidden in loads of archived Nazi documents, a hand-drawn map with instructions to a bright red X and an extremely specific location of what looks to be buried treasure? Well, this actually happened. The Dutch town of Omeren, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, Omeren, made headlines when people started arriving in droves, seeking out a secret location where people believed a stash of Nazi gold and treasures were buried by soldiers. The map didn't have GPS coordinates, of course, (laughs) but the drawings are pretty detailed. After 75 years locked behind confidentiality, the map was discovered in a case file released by the Dutch National Archive. Documents described an incident with a bomb that scattered many valuables around the area, and a few German soldiers pocketed what they could. Later, while retreating, they decided to bury the treasure. That map led people to travel to Omerin, and while effectively swarmed the area in search of this buried stash, Many residents were extremely upset because people were digging holes in seemingly random places and their quaint, tranquil town was being overrun. They sure got their 15 minutes of fame, though. Word is that any buried treasures may have already been looted and retrieved long before the documents were released. I mean, isn't that the kind of mystery that Indiana Jones lived for? (laughs) So sadly, there's almost certainly no buried treasure in the town now, and it has quieted down again. But there are a handful of geocaches in the area for modern treasure seekers to search for, and none of them should be buried. (laughs) You can read up more about the discovery and history in the BBC article linked in the show notes. Have you ever found a geocache and read through the log sheet to find an entry written by someone who doesn't sound like a geocacher? (laughs) Dirtbags Geocaching Down Under shared on Facebook some muggle logs found in a geocache in Australia including entries that read, This is a nice box. If you find this box, you should scream as loud as you possibly can to summon the cows in the neighboring paddock. (laughs) Another read, Found this by accident, whilst frolicking on the hillside. She thought it was a camera and ran away. 
Didn't end up frolicking after all. Sad face. Worst Tinder date ever. Left a... <clears throat> censored. Didn't need it in the end. Sad face. Sad face. <laughs> but on a much brighter note, one read, We proposed on this spot back in 2013. Magical. <laughs> yep, sometimes geocaches can provide some amazing memories, and not just for geocachers. Ever find a memorable muggle note written in a geocache log? Email tgif at cachetheline.net. tgif at cachetheline.net. And now some majorly uplifting news coming at you from California, care of Yosemite Debbie, who posted on Facebook about a recent incident they were a part of. With her permission, here is her wonderful story of what can happen when geocachers come to the rescue. Sometimes the best things you find caching aren't the cache. We pulled into Little Dumont Dunes along a bit of a remote stretch of highway in California just before dusk on the way home from a caching trip. You know, one of those just one more cache kind of unplanned stops. While we didn't find the cache, we did notice what appeared to be a stuck vehicle in the distance, so decided to go investigate since the place was devoid of other vehicles and people, with nighttime fast approaching. It turned out an SUV containing a family of three was stuck, and all four tires were dug down pretty far into the deceptively soft sand. The wife was attempting to do most of the digging out of the tires since her husband was a disabled veteran with back issues. A little girl full of pent-up energy was flitting about unaware of the potential ramifications of being stranded out in the desert with no cell reception to call for help. I kept the chatty child company while the other adults worked on a plan to free the vehicle. One challenge was the stuck SUV was much heavier than our little two-door Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. Sure enough, the first tow-out attempt resulted in our Jeep starting to dig into the sand. Plan B had us attaching two tow ropes together so our Jeep could reach firmer ground. And that worked! By the time the rescue operation was complete, darkness had begun its descent and the couple, as well as us, were anxious to get back on the pavement and off to our destinations in different directions. We said our goodbyes, likely to never meet again. The little girl was particularly sweet and surprised me with her earnest gaze and parting words. I love you, Debbie. Now that's way better than finding a cache. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie, for that great story, and it was wonderful of you to come to their rescue. If you want to see photos from the encounter, the Facebook post is linked in the show notes. Well, I am currently sitting in a tree, well, maybe 10 feet above a whole bunch of rocks on the coastline of Lake Ontario, right next to a highway, safely on the other side of barricades, but in an area that probably doesn't get visited much by pedestrians. <laughs> it's just absolutely beautiful. There's a little bit of ice still remaining on the lake just at the edge and the water level is very low, but the sun is out and the clouds are clear and I am just perched in a tree. This is one of the best things that I love about geocaching, just being so remote, nobody else around and enjoying the crisp, clean air. Well, even though there's a highway next to me with uh, exhaust, but you know what I mean. Fun thing is this is a tree climb and you have to get up and then stretch a little further out onto the limb. I couldn't imagine doing this on a stormy day or with higher water lapping against the rocks. And this one is a one and a half difficulty, four and a half terrain, hasn't been found in a year and a half, but this was needed. Ah, if only you could be here. Sometimes I wonder what these drivers going by are thinking is this orange hood sitting in a tree at the side of the lake. Ah. The things geocachers do, I have to stretch and get this log sheet back in the container before I continue on my merry way. Oh, <laughs> oh this is sketchy. <laughs> All right, so we're back. And now we really want to talk about this uh, excursion this adventure to attempt to hit your fifth and sixth jasmer 
fines, your, your grids. And there's only a certain number of caches that now qualify for that because I think it was August of 2000, I believe. Yeah, August 2000 is, is the month in question. Yes. So four active geocaches in the world that will qualify you for that month. So anybody who's caching now could only, really only get up to four JASMER grids. So the real question is, how did you get fifth and sixth JASMER grids? Well, uh, the, the interesting story here is, and, and your listeners may not know, but I wanted uh, my, our, our good friend Mark Keeker uh, to, to jo join in here, is that uh, uh, because it was not my idea. It was not something that I originally came up with, even though I, I, I like to take credit, but I, I did not come up with the idea of doing the fifth and sixth Jasmine. So Mark and another guy here from uh, Oklahoma, Tulsa, uh, um, started about two and a half years, maybe three years prior to me even uh, knowing about this opportunity. And um, they, there were actually six additional archived uh, August 2000 caches in the world, mm. still on the books. So that would be 10 so, in total. Four active there was, and there six were 10 total. in total. Six yeah, archive, exactly. Yeah. There were six additional ones. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some that were realistic and, and some that are just not possible because either the, the building was gone or what, for whatever situation, there were, there were those six, I believe, that, that did not um, have the capability of getting to them, or, or some of them. And the premise was, is that they, Mark and Robbie came to me and said, hey, um, we've got a little project here we'd like to bring you in on. And um, it was the first question that I got was, are you okay with logging archived caches? I mean, and I said, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I log them all the time with challenges and things like that, but mm -hmm. do I go out and find archived caches in general? And then log them. No, you had a whole show on that the other day. So mm -hmm. the, the general consensus was on on uh, a website on Facebook that um, archiving is okay. You can log some archive caches as long as the cache is there and you sign a log, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I I said sure. You know I I I, I can log archive caches. I don't I don't care. And they said we'd like to bring you in because uh, we have found a way to log two additional August. 2000 caches and i said uh, well okay yeah, but you have to be okay with logging archive caches and i said well okay that's that's good so I, I get six but why me he goes he goes well if we do it nobody will ever notice but if you do it you'll have six and uh, the whole world will notice and they will have a conniption fit mm -hmm. i'm in was my first response <laughs> How do we do this? Well, where are they at? And where in the world do I need to go? <laughs> <laughs> now, to, to be clear, everything. again, this is because you are technically allowed, unless the listing and the cache listing itself is locked, you are allowed to log archive caches as found. Whether that's a legit find or not is up for you to decide and the cache owner if they're still around. But if you have found a cache that was archived and it's still there and you can log the find, you're allowed to do that. So it's within right. the rules. The question is, some right. people have personal ethic to say they will not do that because it's not an active geocache. So that's correct. So do you log it? Is the date correct? And and does it show up on Project GC's Jasmer map as as I found in August 2000? Once you log it, was my first question. Mm -hmm. Meaning is that it looks like we're going to have to put in a lot of work to this thing to 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 find those and get the the right things uh, to to maybe be able to log it. And, and sure enough, we, we, there is a, a story coming that, that, that that's crazy. Mm. So yes, the answer was yes. So they, they would show up in, in stats. So people would have a conniption fit and, and, and fly off the handle and, and make me the, you know, the scumbag of the earth of, of cheaters and, and call me all these names. So I was in, that's, that's what I said. Yes, <laughs> I, that's exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, it from my point of jumping in and and figuring out what we needed to do to find these two additional caches uh, was a three and a half year process. Mm. Wow. So uh, it was it, it was incredible. I mean, the, the amount of work that went into trying to figure out what this was. So we first of all, we wanted to make sure that our logs would not get deleted. 
So mm. we had to go and find the, uh, the original cash owner. Mm. And then we went and spoke with all of the folks that actually logged the cash when they, when they were active caches back in 2000. Mm -hmm. So we need to do research. And so the, the cash owner came back to us and said, you know, I'm not cashing anymore. I don't give a crap what you guys do, but we, we, we know what's going to happen once this gets logged is that you are going to have a massive amount of cashers coming at you, telling you that you need to delete our logs. And they will whine and complain and moan and groan and, yeah. And then to our luck, that cash owner says, all right, I'll let you log it, but, and I will put up with all the guff that comes, his word, guff, if you go and find the original answers and the, to the original questions and satisfy the need of the original requirements of this cash, which here's the, here's the, the kicker is a virtual. Huh. Both of them were virtuals. Yeah. So they were both virtuals. Uh, they both required pictures at a specific um, uh, monument or, or, or historical marker. Mm -hmm. And uh, the questions we had to get from some of the original submissions of Casher that had already, already um, uh, sent the answers to the CL. Mm -hmm. who now lives in another state. He doesn't even live in the state. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, this is pretty easy. We can knock this out. I'll just run down and take a picture at that historical marker and at that uh, time capsule, and, and we'll be done. Mm -hmm. Well, he changed the chords. The mm -hmm. chords were not the chord, the original chords, so we had to recreate where the <clears throat> where this historical marker was and and – we went to the to the levels over three and a half years to figure out where travel bugs had traveled between mm. between the other between the other caches of those two caches and the other cache owners that moved the travel bugs and mm -hmm. put concentric circles in to try and nail down where where those mar that marker and that time capsule could be. Hmm. Uh, all they did was give us a general area, yeah. and so I spent probably better part of a day and a half, two days, uh, on the ground looking at every possible area and hiking area that you that was accessible to try and find this time capsule in, in, in this in this uh, uh, historical marker so we could get the answers off of it hmm. so interestingly enough is that that um, it, after three trips we just could not find and we wanted to find a historical marker first because that would lead us to uh, some of the answers for the, for the other piece and uh, for the other time capsule and we could not find this historical marker anywhere hmm. and so it was like our, our third and final trip and 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 what, what required you to get where the old historical marker was was a, a river crossing onto an old road that, that that got taken out. It was no longer there. So you had to wait for the, the river to be low enough that you could cross it in, in, into the other side. And in one of our final trips down there, we thought maybe we had a little bit of intel and wanted to take somebody else with us. And we crossed the, the river because the river was low that day it was kathy and i and um craziest story ever yeah craziest story ever so we're on the other side of the river we're looking through the sides and so she has to go out and, and, and go use the facilities go use the the forest mm -hmm. right so i'm sitting there looking all over the place and we hear a tractor roll up and the tractor uh-oh uh -oh, here comes a tractor and it's coming right between me and where she went into the woods and so i'm just going to stand here and their little quir quirky dog comes up running and barking at me and he rolls up with his wife on, on this tractor and, and they're, they, they roll over to me with this big, you know, round bale of hay on the front of their tractor and says, uh, can I help you? What are you doing here? And I said, he said, well, we're, we're here looking for what is called a geocache, explain geocaching to him and everything else. And, and right here on this road, right here, we have figured out from historical data that there was a historical marker sign that set right here, right here at the hmm. end of the road. And we were hoping to find it in the bushes and maybe it fell over or something else like that. And he goes, well, one, you're on private land. You're on mm. private land and yeah. there's no, no, there's land. You're not supposed to be over in this side of the river. So, uh, yeah. I apologize. Right. And said, I yeah. just was trying to do that. But so what was you looking for? And I said, well, it was this school and, and this old school used to be built right here somewhere. And there was a historical mar marker commemorating that. And, and we, we haven't been able to find it for two years. And, 
we were, we were just hoping maybe that, that, that we'd miss something. And that's why we crossed the river here and, on this old road. And, and he goes, well, I don't know anything about that, but my aunt does. She's the local <laughs> librarian from the County. Uh -huh. So he picks up and opens up his flip phone. He <laughs> opens his flip phone and calls his aunt. And she goes, blah, 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 blah. I got this guy here talking about the old school. He goes, oh yeah, that's the historical sign. That's, two miles down the road uh, and, and left and right on this road and, and down here. And I go, what? <laughs> Can I talk to her? So I, I'm on the flip phone and I'm saying, Where, what, what roads are those? And so we made the, the 20 mile loop around to get around the other side of the river and, and went over there. And sure enough, the sign that you see on, on, on the, the Winer's uh, Facebook page back behind us, and because we're poster ch children, Keeker and I are poster children on, on the Winer's page. And you see a historical sign behind us. And that's the picture from that sign that took us two, two and a half years to figure out was <laughs> two miles away on some obscure back road. Yeah. And it was in mint condition and it had all the answers that we'd been looking for for three and a half years. Wow. And that led us to the answers for the time capsule that we needed to go find at, a, at which was basically at a, a local high school and, and the, it was the, the subsequent school that that it was the that was the school that took the place of the old school and and they'd had time capsules uh, over hundreds of years and 100 years later they built that time capsule and we got a picture there at that time capsule for the second august 2000 yeah and so we knew exactly what we were looking for once we got the answers off the historical sign wow so that, that so, was a lot of work I'd say you oh, it was, uh, earned it, it, that it, virtual. It, it, oh, it, was, it was the number one, the, the hardest, the the most research and work. And I can't take credit. I was I was the on the ground guy, uh, mm -hmm. Robbie and and uh, Kiker did a little bit of it. But uh, I, I'll say is that the research that went behind trying to figure out and nail down where we were where we needed to look mm -hmm. and and what were the answers that that that, that were the to the original questions that are no longer on the website. You can mm -hmm. look at the locked, locked, locked ones that he took off the questions too. So we had to figure out what the questions were and then mm -hmm. send him the questions. And he finally said, yeah, those are the right questions and you got the right pictures. And, mm -hmm. and, and sure enough, he said uh, like three weeks after, after we logged it and, and uh, the winders came after us is that he goes, I've got no less than 10, 10 people telling me I have to delete your logs. And I said, I told you it was coming. <laughs> I well, told and, you. And that's the thing, right? It, yeah, because geoca physical geocaches are, I mean, if they have lasted that long, some, a very few have, but the original caches are still around. But uh, virtual caches, I mean, it's just a matter of information gathering. And virtuals themselves can be ridiculously simple to, to find and log. And so... It might be a picture. Yeah. Right? It might seem like a simple task to try to grab that old virtual for your stats, but I mean, things can change right. in 20 years just for information gathering, <laughs> obviously. Oh, w w without doubt. Yeah, w w without doubt. And, and there were there were times where I'm thinking, you know, this is not going to be possible. I mean, it just doesn't exist. I th mm -hmm. the, the whole hi historical marker sign, it was gone. It was it was mm -hmm. just gone. If, if, if Robbie, Robbie hadn't goaded me on to say, Hey, I got another lead. I think we might want to look here. And I said, ah, you know, I don't know how many times I've been to this place. And, you know, I, I am positive. I've looked there and I looked on the other side and, and he said, ah, just, just one more time, just one more time. <laughs> right. So <laughs> it was one of those interesting, interesting things that, all right, I'm going to be going down to Austin. I'll go by there on, on, on the way. Let me, let me go by and see if I can find mm -hmm. it. And that's, that's how, uh, it wasn't something that, you know, I, I, I thought it'd be worth it if it, if it came, but, you know, like I said, it was a long time in coming mm -hmm. and, you know, they, uh, they kept pushing me mm -hmm. and that's, that's really, I, I lack motivation after about the first year, year and a half and thinking that, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it it's fruitless, it? and, but they, they kept going and kept pushing me and uh, it, it was, uh, it, it was fun. It yeah. was uh, well worth uh, uh, the negative attention that I got. <laughs> <laughs> How does that compare to the uh, the other virtual that you found? Um, like I said, the second virtual was it was it was the uh, springboard from the first one. It was just it was pretty easy once we knew the name of the school, mm -hmm. right? And we had the answers, and then we could uh, it was easy just 
correlate the two. And it was, it was pretty easy. I mean, meaning it wasn't across a river or through the woods or anything else like that. It was just that now we had the answers that we needed for the, for the second one in the time capsule there and just need mm -hmm. to take a picture of that. So the two were, were connected to each other in a way. They were, yeah, yeah. they, 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 they were because the, the questions on the second one is that, um, uh, it, you found, if you found this one and, and, and you knew what the name of that school was, who's the, who's the progenitor or who's the, mm -hmm. who's, who was the downline and, uh, of the school that they, that ultimately got named and rebuilt for the yep. for the kids in this area or something. So, do you think that any of the other archived uh, August two thousand caches could possibly be findable? Uh, no, because once we did this and everybody had a conniption fit and and sent all the hate mail about us to uh, um, ground speak, they went through and um, one of the reviewers just locked all of them mm. immediately. Yeah. Well, and almost certainly all those other archive caches would be getting a whole lot of attention as well. And the cache owners, if they're physical caches, the cache owners probably not playing anymore. And it would just be a whole yeah. lot of, whole lot of drama. Yeah. Yeah. And they, 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 they didn't want the heat and, and they basically said, Hey, good for you. You, you, you were able to do that. And we we're not gonna let anybody else do it again. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, is that it's all of the game right mm -hmm. my game was to see if we could do it um it went, when they got proposed to me is that can we go out and and pull this off and and not get our logs deleted after we after we did it and, and i having been part of a a couple of uh, crap storms in the past i said they're gonna come i mean mm -hmm. the, these haters are gonna come with a vengeance yep. because it was something one they didn't think of and two they didn't do right yeah, or yeah. they thought of it and they never did it and yeah. how could you do it when i thought of it too and i didn't get to do it or or you cheated to do this and yeah. well, we went by the rules i mean the ceo said answer the questions do the yeah. questions do what you're supposed to do you can you can log an archive cache and there's nothing in the guidelines say you can't so right. uh, i said all right let's let's do it yeah. And there's not, it's not like you're going out and lording it over people and, and trying to make everybody feel like you're better than them because you've got six Jaspers oh. and nobody else is ever going to get it. It's not, it's not like that at all. I, I have one of my stats, the stats mm -hmm. that I care about that I only put on my profile that says two self aggrandizing posts, things that, that I, I went out there and said, Hey, look at me, look at my stats. And there's only two things that I've ever put on like social media or something that I thought, Hey, I'm pretty proud of this, and I did that, and that was mm -hmm. not one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it, it was just something in geocaching that I, it was a, a, a cache or someplace that I went that on, on Guadalupe Peak and we hiked that, and then there was another epic hike that, that mm -hmm. we did that I thought was pretty cool. That I went out there and said, "Hey, I'm proud of what we did here and and accomplished this." But other than that, uh, we have two self-aggrandizing posts out there. <laughs> when when you ha when you see a, a there's there's a whole stat page that says, "Hey, look what I did." You know, yeah. I'm not even on that one. Yeah. And there's, you know, a guy that runs that one that, that puts his stats up there all the time. Hey, look what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's not the game I play. Yeah. I, the, the, the game that I play is torment the obsessed and, and, and absolutely visit places that, that, that are incredible that geocaching can take you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places you don't even know about. And that's, yeah. that's it. Pretty simple. And People think I'm out there to try and be better than them or try to do something better. And no, I mean, there's always somebody better than you. And there's always yeah. somebody that's going to do yeah. something more grandio or, or, or something else. Is that yeah. if that's the game you want to play, let me know how that goes. That's true, I think, though. Yeah, it's like if you're if you're obsessed with trying to be the best at something, you're always going to see somebody who's better and, oh, yeah. and always it, yeah. try to compete against them. A a absolutely. And geocaching yeah. is not a competition. If you like working on statistics and challenges, that's yeah. awesome but it's not a competition. I wrote a whole diatribe about, about this thing about geocaching being fair. There's looking in, in, and I, I, I go at it and saying, is it fair play in geocaching? It can't be fair. Just from social economic situations, <laughs> let alone physical and, and, and uh, capabilities and things like that. It can't mm -hmm. be fair. Well, it's and we, we uh, have a lot of people in my region who have a very high fizzy grid count and when mm -hmm. we talk about that with people from other parts of the continent they're like how is that possible i've just barely got two uh two fizzy grids two dt grids how could you possibly have 50 60 70 80 grids i'm like well 
in our region, we have people who place a whole lot of power trails, riverside mm -hmm. trails, paddle caches, tree climbs, challenge caches, and all of those are very commonly spread across the entire DT grid. So if yeah. we have a lot of people who like to cache a lot in their area, those numbers are going to shoot up. It doesn't mean that we've had better experiences overall than anybody else or that we cache better than anybody else. It's just our region is different than another region. And so when I went to Nevada and we did the ET highway and we looked at some of the challenge caches down there, I was, I was blown away by seeing, uh, I always use this example that there were, there was a, one of those bronze, silver, gold, three challenge caches. So easy, medium, hard. And the bronze, the easy level was, I think it was something like having 20,000 fines. At that point, I was not even halfway there, if I recall. Right. And I was just like, this is easy. <laughs> but right. down in Nevada, it's desert and there's so many trails, so many roads just yeah. littered with caches. That's yeah. an easy count to get to. So it all depends on where you live and how you cache and just enjoy the hobby and stop trying to compare your own stats to other people universally. And, and, and you just, and one of the things that I'll add is that high DT looping comes at a price. Mm. I probably spent a half a million dollars getting my mm. DT loops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, that's crazy. Yeah. So it's not fair, right? I mean, yeah. so now if you find somebody else is willing to spend that money and travel all over the world to, to, to the massive, massive DT loops in, in, in Europe, you know, they're just like I'm talking about going to Spain here in a couple of weeks and, and doing some crazy ones over there by Madrid. It's just people can't do that, nor mm -hmm. do they want to do that, mm -hmm. right? They, they want to go to Madrid to... Just, just to see the, 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 the trash stacked up in Barcelona, right? Yeah. Uh, in some of the touristy things. And yeah. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been done a lot of that. So it's not fair, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. just, uh, if you're looking for fairness, no. Fairness can really only come in how we treat each other in the community. The game yeah. itself is going to be different for everybody within okay. the rules, but yeah. the, uh, the way that we treat each other is where we can be fair to each other. And right. that goes both ways, whether it's uh, calling somebody else uh, bad for cheating or not being concerned with how somebody else caches. Like it's just, yeah, it goes both ways. And some people care about that. Mm -hmm. People care about their image. People, people don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and I get that, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, I, I'd rather embrace it. Just put my head down and run towards it. Yeah, but you'll find a lot of people that don't don't want to do that. They yep. they, they they don't want to be judged, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, uh, maybe there's no drama in geocaching. That's a whole nother <laughs> uh, 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 audio feed here. Uh, I just <laughs> there's no drama in geocaching. It's a fun game. <laughs> well, on that note, I want to thank you, Vince, for being able to and willing to come on and, and chat about this because. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I love about this hobby is the experiences, the adventures, and feeling of being able to complete your accomplishments and goals uh, because it's healthy and it's fun and it's you've got friends to, to meet and hang out with, places to explore and discover. Um, and it just, it expands everything, pretty much everything about, you know, who you are and what you know when you actually start and open the doors to the, uh, the vastness of what this hobby incredible can provide. Friends and people we've met around the world and yeah. people that, that we continue to meet and yeah. want to geocache and, and just yeah. have a good time. And so that, that's it. Hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And to be able to hear the explanation as to how you managed to get six Jasmers, because <laughs> I know anybody who's working on Jasmers probably super curious to find out how, uh, how it was done. And uh, just to hear firsthand what the strategy was and how, to, how it was accomplished. And if anybody has a, another good idea that will torment the, uh, the obsessed, then I'm, I'm always up for it. So <laughs> TTO2, send me a message. <laughs> and I want to thank you again for your ongoing support because you are a patron of Cash the Line. You help support the, uh, the channel and this podcast by extension and, uh, and all that I attempt to do in sharing the awesomeness of this hobby with the world and, and the muggle world and the geocacher world, all of that. So thank you very much again for that. Oh, you bet. What are some of your most memorable adventures? Was it for fun or to accomplish a goal or a challenge? I'd love to hear from you. 
Email tgif at cashtheline.net or phone one in and leave a message at cashtheline.net slash POI. We'd love to hear if you have any comments, funny stories, milestones, accomplishments, rants, and adventures to share. TGIF at cashtheline.net. Thanks for listening to the episode, and please remember to give the show a thumbs up or a positive review. Thank you to all the patrons who support Cash the Line. And if you'd like to join the band of excellent adventurers, please find us on Patreon or by visiting cashtheline.net slash Patreon. You can support Cash the Line and get bonus swag and access to exclusive content for as little as a cup of coffee per month or with a discount by the year. Links and references mentioned in the episode can be found in the show notes linked in the description. See you next month with more exploration into the wide world of excellent geocaching adventures. Please subscribe, follow, share with your friends, and comment wherever you're able. And as always, happy caching and excellent adventure. (laughs) 